few people uh, logging in today, um, but we'll be going over some ground rules and, and some introductions uh, here at the beginning before we dive right in anyway. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. I suppose I should turn on my video. Um, good morning. My name is Natalie Nast. I am the program manager working on the management plans at ADWR. And this is a meeting of the fifth management plans safe yield technical subgroup um, under the management plans work group. So um, before we get started here today, I'm going to hand um, hand things over to McKenna really quickly to just talk through some of the ground rules, some of our logistics for running these meetings. Um, we are probably going to be doing uh, online meetings for a while. So we um, uh, would welcome any feedback or the logistics of the webinars and, and how we're running things or suggestions you might have on how we might improve that. So McKenna. Thanks, Natalie. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to be going over the webinar logistics. Um, if you've been to our previous subgroup meetings, we haven't really changed anything as far as logistics go. Um, so please remain muted when you are not speaking. Um, if you would like to speak, um, just please type your name in the chat box. Alternatively, you can also type your questions and comments in the chat box, and then we will be calling on people throughout the meeting when we pause for comments. If you do experience any technical difficulties, you can reach out to our help desk. Um, we have their phone number up on the slide right now, and that's 602-771-8444. Um, you can also email them at tickets at azwater.gov. And lastly, um, this meeting and the conversations in the chat will both be recorded. And if you could go to the next slide. All right, and then another thing I wanted to go over is that we are launching a new way for you all to provide input. So we've created a Google form with specific questions regarding the concepts presented at today's meeting. Um, this form also provides the opportunity to just give general feedback as well. So we plan on having these Google forms available after every subgroup meeting. Um, we do ask if you are planning to fill out the form, um, try to fill it out within a week. Um, if it's been longer than a week and you still want to provide feedback, you can always email us at managementplans at azwater.gov. And the link is on the slide, but I'm putting it in the chat right now. So um, for those of you who just want to click on it, it's in the chat box. And um, I wanted to ask if anyone had any questions on the form before we move on to the presentation. All right, if anyone does end up having any questions, you can um, put them in the chat and I can respond to them too. Um, thank you and we look forward to your feedback. Thanks, McKenna. Um, so, just as a way of introduction, uh, as I said, my name is Natalie Mast. You just heard from McKenna Welch. Um, as, as you may have noticed, McKenna is uh, logged into the webinar today as ADWR Planning and Permitting. So, if you have any um, webinar questions or that kind of thing, you can reach out uh, in the chat box directly to her. Or, as she said, you can always email us at managementplans at easywater.gov. Um, McKenna is kind of running the back, uh, the back end of our, our webinar today, the te technical bits of the webinar. Um, we also have Maggie Martin on um, the webinar today. She is going to be helping out with the chat. So if you um, have a question that you'd like to enter into the chat box or would like to speak, Maggie will be helping read out those comments or um, calling on people to speak as we work through um, any questions you might have today. Um, and we also have Amanda Long Rodriguez on um, the webinar today, and she's going to be uh, providing a lot of the presentation, today, talking a lot about the um, long term analysis of uh, Safe Yield. So, uh, welcome to all of you. We, we know there's a lot going on. We know all of you are very busy. 
So we do appreciate the time that you're taking to be here today. So we'll go ahead and dive right in. If we could go to the agenda slide, please. Great. So we do have just a couple items to uh, go back over on the annual safe field calculation. Um, if you're going to go into that um, questionnaire link, you'll, you'll see that we're going to be asking you for feedback on a number of things, including whether um, uh, we have good consensus on um, that annual safe field calculation and, and that type of thing. So, so I would encourage you to um, utilize that questionnaire for, for additional feedback here. Um, so we do want to wrap up just a couple uh, additional items on the annual safe field calculation, but we want to spend most of today talking about um, the long-term analysis of, of safe field and the management goals. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, as many of you know, I think most of you have probably seen this slide before, uh, but we'll reiterate our timeline here. We are working on, at ADWR, we are working on two concurrent processes associated with the management plans. We're working to finalize the remaining fourth management plans by the end of this calendar year. And we are working at the same time to develop the fifth management plans. So our kind of tentative timeline for the fifth management plan is that we wanna spend the remainder of this year continuing to develop those fifth management plans spend most of 2021 drafting, writing those plans, and um, then spend 2022 actually adopting those plans. So uh, we are making really good progress in, in these subgroups, and we do appreciate all of the time that so many of you have put into that process and that development work. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, the, that development process is occurring through these management plans work group meetings. Um, this is one of the subgroups of the management plans work group. We are in a lot of our groups really moving into um, the, the development phase here, developing um, additional conservation strategies and um, making sure that our um, existing management strategies are functional and updating those to make sure that they are moving us toward our goals. Um, in this, uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. In this particular subgroup, our, our approach to kind of working towards those goals of the full work group uh, was to first get consensus on the annual calculation and then consider approaches for the long-term analysis of safe fields. So as I mentioned, we're, we're talking a lot about the long-term analysis of safe fields today. Um, and then the third goal for this group is to talk about some methods of how we talk about safe field. We'll, we'll touch on this a little bit today, um, uh, but really um, where we're at in this group is that we uh, definitely want feedback and, and thoughts from all of you on um, how, how we might best communicate safe field. I, I think it's been made abundantly clear over the uh, uh, progress of this group that that it's a complicated thing. It's it's a difficult thing to communicate accurately and clearly. Um, so we would definitely love to have some suggestions from all of you on on what those best practices for communicating safe field might be or communicating status of each AMA total goal. So if we could move to the next slide. Um, I do want to give everyone a heads up uh, before we I hand it over to Amanda um, or I still have a few, sorry, excuse me. Uh, I do want to give everybody a heads up about data availability. I know we included um, a little note about this in the um, email about today's meeting. So hopefully at least some of you saw that. Uh, but we are very excited that um, we've published a, uh, an update to the Safe Field dashboard. So a lot of the long-term analysis um, strategies that we're going to be talking about today are um, available in kind of an interactive form on that dashboard. You have to kind of, uh, Amanda will walk you through it later, you have to kind of toggle through the, the different pages, but there's a lot of filters and, and that kind of thing that make it a really great functional tool, and we're very excited with how it turned out. 
So um, yes, so please definitely check that out. I think it'll be a really helpful tool as all of you are thinking about these issues. Um, so with that, um, I will go ahead and dive right in. So we do have just a couple more items to follow up on on the annual safe field calculation. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. There we go. Um, as many of you know, and, and as many of you have heard in these meetings before, um, safe yield is, is statutorily defined. It's, it's a groundwater management goal for four out of our five AMAs um, that includes components of an annual uh, balance between withdrawals and recharge and uh, a long-term balance. So uh, as I mentioned, we've, we've discussed a lot of that annual calculation and we're kind of moving into discussing how we define long-term and how we analyze long-term safe yield. Um, it's, it's always worth mentioning that the Pinal AMA does have a different goal, but also just for the instructiveness of it, we do analyze overdraft and safe yield with regards to the Pinal AMA because it can still be a useful indicator for um, kind of the long-term uh, planning prospects for, for that AMA. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. So we've talked a lot about this annual calculation. I'm not gonna go back over the inflows and outflows pieces today. Um, but you can see a lot of that, um, both the definitions and the actual data associated with those inflows and outflows on our dashboard. We did have just a couple outstanding items that we wanted to discuss today um, uh, that we wanted to follow up on. Uh, and those two things are um, municipal incidental recharge and agricultural incidental recharge. Um, and maybe before I move on um, to, to addressing those two items, I can just pause for a minute here and see if anyone has any questions or if there's anything else that we've missed uh, that we would still need to discuss for the annual calculation of safe yield. Um, as we had mentioned before, you can uh, either type questions into the chat box or you can just type your name in there and we'll um, help you get unmuted so you can actually just uh, speak as well. Thank you, Natalie. I don't see any comments or questions coming through at this time. And we will, thank you, Maggie. Um, we will have uh, opportunity for, for other questions and that kind of thing throughout the presentation. Um, so feel free to, to type those in at, at any time and we'll call on you when we get to the points in the presentation um, where we'll be taking questions. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, if we could move to the next slide then, we'll go ahead and uh, have this discussion about municipal incidental recharge. So the current status of municipal incidental recharge is that it is calculated as a percent of total municipal demands. Um, that percentage was set for certain AMAs based on their assured water supply rules. Uh, and that was um, just kind of a, a strategy that we took historically. Uh, the, however, the assured water supply rules only include that rate for Phoenix Pinal and Tucson AMAs. That 4% rate was not included in the Prescott Assured Water Supply Rules, and the Santa Cruz AMA has not yet adopted its Assured Water Supply Rules. So um, what we would like to do, uh, our, our proposal for, for this item, is that just for these purposes, obviously we're not proposing um, changing these rules or anything like that, but just for the purposes of calculating safe yield, we would wanna be consistent across the board and include that 4% municipal incidental recharge rate also for the Prescott and Santa Cruz AMAs. Um, does anybody have any questions, thoughts, feedback on that? Um, we, can, we can pause for a minute here to allow anyone to um, jump in. 
or um, you could also provide this type of feedback on um, on that questionnaire form that we provided at the beginning, and we'll also provide that link at the end. Thank you, Natalie. I see a comment um, has come through here from Ken Seashells. He's noted, note, individual water providers can seek a higher percent IR factor and a number have based on urban irrigation occurring in their service area. Uh, that's that's a good point, and actually, that is already included. It's um, it's a separate line item in that calculation, and I guess we didn't call that out specifically. Um, urban irrigation is treated differently. It does get a higher percentage. I'm not remembering that percentage off the top of my head, but but that's already factored in there, um, kind of as a separate line item. Thanks, thanks for um, that reminder. Ken. Thank you, Natalie. We have a comment as well here come through from Carlos. He's commented, consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Sarah Porter has commented, Carlos, that would be a foolish consistency. No further comments or questions. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, so we are definitely um, hoping for additional feedback on, on this. This is definitely something that you could use um, that feedback form for, or uh, definitely feel free to reach out um, to me, to that management plans at azwater.gov email if you have any further questions, comments. Um, and, and we would also absolutely like to hear uh, support or not support for this. Um, I think it's I think it's helpful to hear hear the positive side of this as well. If if people feel like this is a pretty neutral thing, we we would like to hear that as well. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead um, and move on. And so for the agricultural incidental recharge, we did introduce this just really briefly that we would need to address this at our last meeting. So. Um, what we discussed at that time was uh, rather than achieve, um, uh, getting the um, agricultural incidental recharge numbers from ADWR's models, uh, which are lagged and calculated in different ways, we would um, assign an incidental recharge rate for each AMA. Um, and, and similar to what we do for um, municipal and industrial demands, we would we would uh, base the incidental recharge on a percentage of total demand. So um, we, at that time, had thrown out this calculation that that the incidental recharge rate would be a combination of application losses, which is um, basically the inverse of irrigation efficiency, and transmission losses, so lost and unaccounted for water. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll hand um, the presentation over to Amanda, and um, she'll have a little bit more information on how we looked at, how, how we approached these numbers and how um, we might assign a, a potential irrigation, uh, excuse me, a potential incidental recharge rate for each active management area. Amanda? Good morning, everyone. This is Amanda Long Rodriguez on talking. I am the program coordinator for the management plan group. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we went about calculating this agricultural incidental recharge percentage. Um, so we first used field verification data for the Pinal AMA. Um, this data is collected by USGS for ADWR periodically. In their field verification, USGS looks at individual fields, and then the numbers they provide to ADWR are an average of those individual fields. Um, so this is a pretty large data set, um, and we think it might be a reasonable starting place for calculating the irrigation efficiencies for um, each AMA. So to customize the Pinal irrigation efficiency data to each AMA, as we know, the proportion of irrigation methods is different by each AMA. We use data from, um, again, the USGS on um, irrigation, <clears throat> sorry, on acreage of irrigation methods by AMA. And the results are in this graph here to the right. It shows the proportion of irrigation method by AMA 
um, you can see that there is um, a large proportion of flood irrigation and it dominates most of the EMAs. Uh, the graph also shows the proportion of sprinkler and then also micro drip methods. So we use this uh, proportion of each irrigation method for each AMA. Um, we kind of converted, or let me back up here a little bit. Um, so the data sorry, shows irrigation method by county. And what we did with the county level data is we converted that to AMA. Sorry, I uh, meant to say that earlier. And then um, the results of the um, irrigation method by AMA are shown in this graph here on the right. Um, so we use this proportion of irrigation method for each AMA and applied the irrigation efficiency um, from that Pinnell data that we get from USGS. And the results are in this table here to the left. So originally it was surprising to us to see such similar um, um, irrigation efficiencies for each of the AMAs. However, this is largely driven by the large proportion of flood irrigation in each AMA. So to go back to that suggested calculation that um, Natalie presented in the previous slide, um, here on the top right, the percent egg incidental recharge we're suggesting is a sum of the percentage of transmission and application losses. Um, so on the bottom here, we're proposing transmission losses of about 6%. So typically 10% is on the higher end um, used for lost and unaccounted for. Um, but since it's generally not that high for our calculation, we're proposing to use about 8%. And we also know that a proportion of LNU is evaporation. So we're proposing about 25% of the LNU is evaporation. And 25% is also the number that's used in the Pinnell model. So transmission losses then would be 75% of 8% LNU, which is about 6%. And then from the table on the left, we are proposing an irrigation efficiency of 76% or a 24% application loss. So adding these together, we're proposing a percent agricultural incidental recharge of about 30% for all of the AMAs. And then we would multiply this by the total demand to get the um, agricultural incidental recharge. Um, so I guess I'll pause there and we'll take any questions that we might have on um, this calculation or on the municipal incidental recharge calculation. Thank you, Amanda. I have a question here from Pam Muse. She commented, are transmission losses equivalent to canal seepage in the historical safe yield calculation ABWR has done? Uh, I can chime in there. Uh, this is Natalie. Um, yes, Pam, it's it's uh, it's similar. Essentially, uh, your canal seepage is going to be a portion of um, lost and unaccounted for. So, total transmission losses would be all of your lost and unaccounted for. Uh, I, I maybe canal seepage might have been a, a better way to phrase this. Um, this is this is kind of the portion of uh, transmission losses that are not um, attributed to evaporation. So it's it's very similar to the canal seepage um, portion there. Yes. Thank you, Natalie. Question from M. Lawyer: Does incidental recharge apply to safe yield? Uh, yes, so so incidental recharge is part of the inflows um, in, inflow calculation for safe yield. So um, uh, if you were to go back, I, we, we're not necessarily going to go back through that whole calculation uh, today, but if you were to go back to some of our previous uh, presentations, you can see the your, your pumping is an outflow for safe yield. The incidental recharge and natural recharge components are, are kind of the inflow um, portions of, of safe yield. And the balance of those things is, is where we look at overdraft or, or safe yield. Thank you, Natalie. Kristen McJunkin is wondering, did you look at differences between districts within the same AMA? Um, so for this, we did not. We looked at the county level um, irrigation methods. Right. So we, we didn't necessarily have district level data um, 
so we weren't able to split it out quite that uh, to quite that detailed of a level. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Question here from Terry Sue Rossi. She's wondering: Does a six percent include CPIDs associated with SCIDD? Um, we we didn't differentiate um, between the different irrigation districts for for these purposes. Um, we if if there's a different additional information or additional recommendations that people had um, regarding different types of canals and the different uh, irrigation districts or those types of things, we would certainly be open to suggestion there. Thank you, Natalie. Krista McJunkin is following up on her previous question. She's noted it may not be a significant difference, but worth testing if you can get the data. We would provide what you need for SRP. A couple additional questions and comments coming through here from Ken Fischel. He's commented, it is responsible re approach for this purpose, but it's important to note that irrigation efficiency represents distribution uniformity, and it does not account for leaching, which can be, which can be significant. The IR factors used in the groundwater flow models tend to be higher than what is proposed here. We can I look into that a little bit, thanks. I have a question here from Jessica Fox. She's commented, would you be removing canal seepage component or reducing the volume associated with it since somehow it included in the AGIR? Also agree with Krista, you should evaluate by district. That's a good question, Jessica, thank you. Um, we we can double check. I my impression was that the two numbers were distinct, but I can definitely follow up with our hydrology people to make sure that that's not um, double counting in any way. It's a it's a good thing to double check. We'll we'll confirm that and and can follow up on that. Thank you, Natalie. Question here from Eric B. Is the goal here to have a static number that is calculated once and never changes? even as ag irrigation types change over time and within different AMAs? Uh, it's a good question. Um, so the intent is, is definitely not a static number forever. Um, <laughs> what, what we've seen here is that uh, those types of irrigation methods tend to change very slowly over time. So we would certainly reevaluate these numbers over time as we get additional data, um, but we uh, don't necessarily anticipate that this is, uh, that, that that would have to be an annual process or anything like that. It may be something we do with each management plan or something along those lines. Um, but again, with, with that as well, we're certainly open to suggestion. Thank you, Natalie. Question here from Lacey James. Do transmission losses include lined underground canals? That's a really good question. I'm not sure. I would have to check on that. We can follow up on that. Thank you, Lacey. Thank you, Natalie. Comment here from Xu Yun. If the canal is unlined, the transmission loss could be much more significant than lined canals. No further questions or comments coming through. Okay. So we would definitely welcome um, on, on this item, as with the last one, um, additional feedback um, through the questionnaire form or by email. Um, and we uh, have a couple things to follow up on. So, so this may be um, uh, an item that we'll need to check in on at our next meeting as well. So I appreciate all your feedback and questions. Thank you. Um, and I think I'll hand it back to Amanda. I'm sorry, I think there's just one more question here. I think um, Mark might have messaged it to me privately. 
says, will ADWR look at new stormwater incidental recharge projects that are development wide or regional in nature based on flood control issues and passive landscape designs? That's a really good question. I will have to check in with our um, hydrology group on how those are accounted for. My, my impression was that those were accounted for in, in another component, but I'll have to confirm that. Thanks. All right, so I'll move on to the next part of the presentation here. Um, so in the previous um, safe, road, safe Yield work group meeting, we began talking about the um, long-term analysis of Safe Yield. Um, so as a reminder, and Natalie touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, the statutory definition is twofold. So that annual calculation, which we've been talking about in the past couple of meetings, and it seems like um, we might be near consensus on. And then the other part of a safe yield definition is the long-term analysis. Um, so in this portion of the meeting, I'll talk about the update that we've done to the safe yield dashboard, um, a proposed method for the long-term analysis of safe yield, and then I'll hand it back to Natalie to introduce um, the communication methods for safe yield. Um, so at the last meeting, and we introduced the possible methods for the long-term analysis, and we've heard feedback to make this information available for the other AMAs and to provide a more in-depth look at the methods that we've presented. So we've updated the dashboard um, with additional tabs to reflect the discussion and feedback that we had from the last meeting. Um, the dashboard is available on the AMA data webpage, um, which I think that um, McKenna also Put that into the chat box earlier in the meeting. And so I'm going to just walk us quickly through um, the tabs of the updated dashboard, and then uh, this will also be a good summary of the last meeting. Mm -hmm. All right, so the dashboard is available here on the ADWR um, AMA data page down here at the bottom. Okay, so this first page is what uh, McKenna worked on earlier in the year. It's been available now for a few months. And this was uh, focused on the annual components, um, for the annual calculation. Um, we did add a link here to the AMA management goals, um, just as the different AMAs have different management goals. So we added a link there, so that's clear. Um, but I'm going to focus on the uh, updates that we did to the dashboard. Um, so this first one that we did was adjusting all the inflows and outflows by time. So this tab um, shows different, different averaging methods that we looked at. Here you can look at each of the individual AMAs. You can um, change the method that we're looking at. Um, you can click to the different definition pages. So that one up there is for that management goals page I just showed you. And then here below, you can click to a definitions page. And so this has all the definitions of the components in that first page, and then also the different methods that were used um, that I'll talk about when I go through the rest of the dashboard. And then here in the bottom right is kind of the raw annual inflows and outflows. So this is the same as the first tab, the original dashboard um, without the component shown. Uh, so another potential method we talked about was smoothing for certain components that might be contributing to the variability. In the last meeting, we showed adjustments to the natural components. So in this tab, we showed the different methods of removing that variability um, for all the AMAs. Um, so a lot of this is similar to that previous page. You can click around for the different AMAs. You can choose um, the different methods. And then you can also get to those um, same two definition pages that I talked about earlier. And then again, this bottom right shows the um, annual inflows and outflows unadjusted. Um, so you can compare the methods with the original data.
so at the previous meeting, we also talked about how we are defining long term. Does long term mean five or 20 years, or is it the length of the management plan? So this nest tab um, kind of shows all those different time periods. It shows an average of all the years of inflows and outflows that by the specified amount of time. So 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and then by management plan periods. And similar to the other slides, you can click around to the different AMAs. Um, and then also get to that uh, management goals definition page. Okay, so in this next tab, um, in the previous meeting, we kind of discussed acknowledging the role that each sector has to play in safe field. So we looked at splitting the inflows and outflows by sector. The issue being that um, splitting by sector would mean we'd have to split the natural components, which aren't assigned to any one sector. And there's many different ways that this could be done with each with their own pros and cons. Um, so in this tab, we showed two potential methods that I introduced in the last meeting. So you can again choose an AMA and you can choose a method and that will adjust um, each of the sectors, agricultural, municipal, and industrial. And then again, you have the, the TL tab, which shows the unadjusted data for comparison. Um, so keep in mind also when you're exploring this data that all of the um, scales are a little bit different depending on the size of the sector, um, industrial being really quite small. So keep that in mind while you're exploring. And then again, you can um, click on these links here to move to the definition pages. So this last tab is something that we briefly mentioned at the previous meeting, um, but it had quite a bit of positive feedback. Uh, we did some more work with this method to put it into the dashboard and we want to introduce it as our proposed way of looking at safe fields in the long run. This kind of takes a combination of methods. It takes into account a longer term cycle of natural components and a shorter term um, cycle of human caused or artificial components. And we looked at different combinations of long and short term averages, you can see down here in the methods. And then again, you can choose a different AMA. Um, and then the unadjusted data again is here in this bottom right hand corner and then those two definition tabs um, can be linked to as well. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time digging into the proposed method here in a little bit, but I want to stop here um, for any questions you might have on the dashboard. We're excited to hear your feedback on it. The dashboard's relatively easy to update and can reflect changes and it can reflect any discussion that we have in this meeting. Do we have any questions on the dashboard? Thank you, Amanda. I don't see any questions coming through. Great. We do hope that you will all uh, take a look at it, click around on it. Um, let us know if you have any questions or if there's anything that we can improve upon there. Uh, we do hope that this dashboard will kind of be a work in progress that will um, evolve over the course of these conversations. Um, and, and as we kind of determine what our final methods and, and approaches are gonna be here. So we would definitely appreciate um, any feedback you all may have. Thanks, Natalie. So again, the dashboard's located here on the AMA data page. Um, and that link will be in the presentation and then also make a put it into the chat box too. Okay, so to expand on this proposed method that I showed in that last tab of the dashboard, this method again takes a longer term average of natural components and a shorter term average of the human caused or artificial components. So this acknowledges the longer natural cycles and helps to remove variability that might be caused by very dry or very wet years. And it also acknowledges um, a shorter cycle of human caused or artificial components. It helps us to um, remove the masking effects in the AMAs where there has been progress in different years and also removes the masking effects of lack of progress. So I've listed the natural and artificial components by inflows and outflows here on the left and in the middle columns. 
And if we continue to explore uh, this method, what we'll want to discuss next is um, what we are considering long versus short term. So for the long term, we want to acknowledge again the drier future and also a, long, a longer natural cycle. So this could be all of the data that we have available. We can choose a number of years like I did in the dashboard, maybe 10 or 20 years. We could follow um, some natural cycles that exist, um, maybe ENSO or the El Nino, La Nina cycles, which are around three to seven years on average five. Um, we could also follow cycles of specific climate variability, um, which are periods of around 20 years. Or maybe we could follow precipitation or weather patterns. Um, you can do the number of years that encompass maybe a large precipitation event, so maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, for the human cause cycles or the shorter term cycles, for the artificial components, we could again choose a number of years, maybe five or 10 years. We could maybe use three years to align with um, GPCD and, or LNU estimates. Um, we could alternately follow economic patterns. For example, we could look at large changes to unemployment, population growth, or changes in GDP. Um, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on the method or on what we should consider when we're defining long and short term or what other methods we might consider when looking at safe fields in the long term. So I'll stop there if there's any questions or comments. Thank you, Amanda. No questions or comments at this time. Thanks, Maggie. So the, the kind of feedback we're looking for here is uh, maybe is the general method acceptable? Uh, does it seem reasonable to have long-term averages for those natural components and short-term averages for those um, artificial components? And also as, as we're kind of defining those terms of long-term and short-term, um, we'll, we'll wanna dig in a little bit more to um, what those cycles look like. Um, I, the, the list that Amanda's included here is, uh, these are things that have come up in conversation um, and there are probably arguments to be made for each of them. Um, but since we're kind of <laughs> looking to establish a methodology here, um, we do want to have a discussion about all of this. Obviously, this is something that we'll also have to discuss a little bit further at future meetings as we kind of pin down these details in, in the methodology here. So we definitely are looking for feedback on, on all of that. All right, if there isn't any questions or comments, I guess I'll pass it back to you, Natalie, to talk about the um, communication piece. Great. Sorry, Natalie, I have a couple of comments and questions coming through now. Krista McJunkin has commented, long-term cycles for natural components make sense. We support that approach. Jessica Fox has commented, we support a 20-year average for natural components and a three or five-year average for artificial components. Ken Seacholes has commented, nice job on the overdraft dashboard, helpful and visually compelling. Krista has also commented, appreciate the work that went into this dashboard. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We do we do appreciate all of that. Uh, we we are definitely really proud to have this out there. We we know that this type of a tool is something that's really helpful for the stakeholders. So um, we're definitely looking forward uh, to you all getting to dig into it a little bit more and and hearing um, any additional feedback that you may have. Um, uh, Jessica, thank you for, for those specifics as well. We do um, really appreciate that, that additional uh, specificity there with that, that um, feedback. So thank you. Thank you, Natalie. A couple more comments have uh, come through now. Lacey James has commented, agree the dashboard is very helpful, well done. And Carlos Ronstad um, agrees with the comments on the dashboard and is also commented, I assume you mean a rolling average. Uh, for the for the cycle length. So so for example, if we were to go with five or ten years on the short term cycle length, that would be a, a rolling average. Yes, it wouldn't be um, 
that kind yeah. of stuff just at the bureau and leverage it. And the methods in the dashboard as well are um, the three and five. They're defined in the definition tabs, but they are um, a majority of them. Most of them are rolling averages. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Natalie. I have a question here from Patrick Adams. He's commented, the proposed message for both AGIR and long-term smoothing are a lot to take in via PowerPoint presentation. Could ADWR write up a brief written overview of the proposed approaches to assist stakeholders in providing feedback? So um, the, I, I think the, and maybe someone else can chime in here. Um, uh, the dashboard does have definitions. So there are explanations of each of those methods um, contained within the dashboard. So, so I would, I would personally point you there for um, uh, looking for the details about that longer term smooth smoothing. Um, for ag incidental recharge, I, I honestly would just point you back to kind of the slides that we presented. And if there are additional questions or ad additional information that we could provide there, um, we'd certainly be happy to do so. Um, I, we weren't at this point intending to write up anything separate. Um, but we can certainly be open to um, additional uh, answering additional questions or providing additional support on, on those items. Um, just as maybe a slightly different thing to that, um, as we do wrap up in this particular group, we do intend to uh, write up some kind of a report um, focusing on the conversations that we had here and the decisions that we made and really detailing the methodology here um, just to make sure that we're kind of thoroughly documenting this for for future management plans um, so uh, all of this will eventually be documented in some kind of a report but um, the details of that are, are still kind of to be determined thank you natalie I have a question here from Jessica Fox. She is wondering, when would you like to have this methodology established before the five MPs are produced so we have the information to develop management strategies in response or as part of the five MPs? So at this point, it's kind of as a part of the fifth management plans. We have been doing a lot of um, uh, program development, obviously, kind of concurrently with um the development of this methodology but we do think that this um, methodology is something that can really be carried forward into the future and and is something that we hope to uh kind of continue and maintain um with the dashboards and that type of thing going forward thank you natalie i don't see any additional questions or comments Great. Okay. Um, I did get. Uh, okay. No, sorry. Never mind. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on. Um. So as I talked about at the beginning, we do also, as a part of this group, um, uh, want to tackle a little bit of how is it that we even talk about safe fields, um, the annual components, the inflows and outflows. Um, we, we seem to have kind of stumbled into some ways that, that are intuitive for, for helping people understand this. Um, so, so we want to maintain kind of that, that terminology around inflows and outflows and that type of thing. But we also want to be able to communicate um, where each active, manager, active management area is with regard to its goal. So things that would be helpful here is, is some strategies to communicate safe field that are simple and clear, that are also accurate, and also um, communicate where the status of a given AMA or where progress is needed. So um, having all of those things, uh, as, as I'm sure many of you can see, is a really difficult thing. So that's um, part of what we'll really want to talk about going forward um, is how can we approach this? Can we can we get some suggestions around best, best practices for how we talk about safe field so that we can have a little bit of consistency out there um, and making sure that uh, we're not getting crossed terms and, and that kind of thing. Um, 
So if we could move to the next slide, please. Um, so in kind of thinking about this um, internally, we have identified a few things that we've heard from stakeholders, um, a few things that come up in conversation, a few things that make intuitive sense to us. Um, but we also want to hear from you all. Um, I, I personally know that <laughs> always intuitive to everyone else. I, I think the putting a graph up is, is good communication, but I know uh, <laughs> not everybody uh, likes the graphs like I do. So, so what we want to um, try to think about um, here is what types of strategies do we have available? Are there strategies that we need to add to this list? Are there risks associated with a given strategy? And, and how can we think about those strategies to kind of mitigate some of those risks or at least communicate some of the caveats associated with a given strategy? So um, I'll, we do have a few minutes here, so I'll go ahead and go through each of these individual items. Um, one thing that we've heard um, that some other places are doing uh, when they talk about, um, if, for example, in California, when they talk about sustainable yield, often they talk about um, a, a specific number as a target. Um, that's certainly something we could consider in as a part of these communication strategies. Um, the, with the benefits being that it's clear, it's easy to understand, but on, on the opposite side of that, um, that actual number, as we're seeing with kind of this long-term analysis of safe yield, assigning a number there can be really difficult and might be variable over time. So it might put um, a lot of weight on one metric that might not be that reliable. Um, so, so there's some, some kind of balance we have there. Um, uh, another item here, this is, this is one question that I have heard a lot from stakeholders is, okay, well, how far is this AMA from safe yield? Um, and if we could figure out a way to answer that question, uh, it, it would be nice to have something that was clear and easy to understand um, but again, your number might be hard to determine, variable, and again, too much weight on a single metric. Um, some of these other strategies that we've listed on the chart here um, might uh, get away from some of these, these variability risks, but they might not be as quantitative. So, so what we might um, want to do is take a hybrid approach um have have a number of different strategies but also just be aware and be communicating some of the caveats associated with some of these different approaches um i think we might have a question um so i'll go ahead and pause there and take any questions we have thank you natalie i have a question here from sarah porter she is wondering what is the primary audience for communications under discussion uh, that is that is a really good question. Thank you, Sarah. And um, perhaps there might be different strategies for for different audiences. Um, largely, when we're just communicating simple status of an AMA uh, with regard to its goal, we're probably going to be communicating to the general public at that high level for for that item. So um, if we're going to get more into the weeds, obviously that's going to be a more, more focused technical audience, someone that's more familiar with the issues and the terminology. But if we're just saying this AMA is this far from safe field, I, I think that we would want uh, that type of a statement to be um, approachable to the general public. Thank you, Natalie. I have a comment here from Kristen McJunkin. She agrees with Sarah. She agrees that we need different approaches for general public versus within water leaders. I have a comment here from Mark Holmes. He's commented incentive programs or plans, state or AMA funded. I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Incentive programs or plans, 
state or AMA funded? It seems as though maybe it's a suggestion rather than a, a question. Sure. Okay. Um, and <laughs> we've, we've certainly heard a lot of um, uh, suggestion around, around different types of incentives. Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of complexity <laughs> there. Um, so uh, we, we appreciate the suggestion. And, and if, if there are uh, mechanisms that people know of or, or might suggest for those types of incentives, um, obviously uh, funding is, is something that's always a challenge. Um, but if there are other types of non-financial financial incentives that we might be able to put in place through the management plans, we would certainly be open to hearing those types of suggestions. Thank you, Natalie. Comment here from B. Fleck. I think you will need a quantified distance from safe field and a trend to communicate the situation. Thank you, Brett. And a comment from Ken Seashold. He's commented, as has been recently noted by EMWA, the net effect of long-term storage and recovery has a modest impact on the calculation of safe field. However, it is an important, important strategy for and thereafter maintain because that stored water will be used when surface water supplies are reduced. In communicating progress towards safe field, I would suggest also including the volume of long-term storage credits as an acknowledgement of the large investment made by AWBA, tribes, individual water providers, and others? Um, thank, thank you for the, the comment, Ken. Uh, so um, the current calculation for safe field does not include those types of long-term storage credits because those are not legally classified as um, groundwater. Uh, they're, they're whatever type of water they were stored as. Um, so what we might be able to do is um, provide kind of a separate chart acknowledging a uh, volume of water stored, volume of water recovered, those types of things. I think that's, I, I fully agree that that's valuable information and, and the, um, the work done by the water bank is, um, has been really beneficial. So um, that's that's certainly information we can consider sharing, but it might not necessarily be strictly the domain of safe field. Um, uh, perhaps that's that's something we can have a further conversation about. I'm, I'm certainly open to suggestion on that. Thank you, Natalie. Comment here from Munderlow. He's commented the first three strategies are inseparable. On strategy four, suggest we try not to split natural recharge, but we could discuss trends by sector. Okay, interesting. That's that could be an interesting approach. Thanks, John. Thank you, Natalie. No further questions or comments right now. Great. Um, well, we will go ahead and move on. I do very, very much appreciate. Oh, I think I saw one more come in. Um, uh, we do very much appreciate the discussion, though, and um, we'll, we'll get to that additional comment in just a second. Um, I do want to just um, reiterate again, uh, you all are, are very much welcome to reach out to us anytime uh, at our management plans at azwater.gov email, or also um, we're kind of testing out this new questionnaire for, for additional feedback after the meetings where we're um, definitely looking for additional feedback and are open to suggestions on how we might improve that type of survey after each meeting as well. Uh, Maggie? Thank you, Natalie. Question from Krista McDuncan here. Setting a specific number as an annual target doesn't seem workable. Given the margin of error inherent in safe field factors that are estimated and even in the accuracy of those safe field factors that are measured, could we apply a plus or minus margin to the safe yield goal? Um, yeah, per perhaps that's uh, is something we should discuss in the context of, of these communication strategies. That could be an interesting approach. It's, I don't think that's uh, something we've discussed at this point. So I am certainly open to looking into that. 
Thank you, Natalie. Comment from Lacey James. I think when communicating this information out, we should highlight this is all model and data-based and does not include actual groundwater depth. Just my thought. Sure, thanks, Lacey. Um, yeah, so so definitely um, Safe Yield uh, being kind of this legal groundwater focused thing um, is is different than than depths to groundwater uh, or or groundwater levels, and it's it's different uh, than not seeing any groundwater level changes, especially at a localized level. This is an AMA scale thing; it's a groundwater focused thing. So so I do are really important. And I think that's something um, that will, in, in that report that I mentioned earlier, I think that's definitely something that we'll um, want to carefully define as, as we consider um, uh, what we'll be including in that report. I appreciate that. Thank you, Natalie. Krista has commented uh, that she agrees with Lacey and that these are separate issues. Additional question from Xu Yan here. Can long-term water level trend be used to assist the determination of safe yields? Uh, thanks. Um, it's a good question and it, it might be tricky to kind of parse out. I think some of that is provided by the data that we um, uh, get from ADWR's groundwater models, particularly those natural components of recharge. Um, but perhaps that's something that, that we can have further conversations with, um, with our hydrology group about. Thank you, Natalie. John Munderlow has commented, based on earlier discussion, I assume the annual targets would be calculated as rolling averages over three or five years. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that would be to be determined here. I think that's, that's probably reasonable. Um, I think whatever method we land on on the kind of long-term analysis of safe yield would, would transfer over to um, these communication strategies as well. It's a good question. Thank you, Natalie. I think that's all for questions and comments right now. Great. Thank you very much. We we know these um, online forums can be a little bit challenging, so we really appreciate everybody's participation and, and commenting. Uh, this this group loves the chat box, which is is a really functional way for us to do this. That's that's great. <laughs> it's perfect. Maggie, I think I saw one more come in. Yes. I have a question here from Jessica Fox. She's commented, the overarching gap in communication seems more related to how ADWR interprets the results of the safe yield calculation. This relates to the utility of the goal. We don't think the calculation in and of itself is incorrect. There could certainly be improvements or tweaks to some components, but ultimately, how does ADWR interpret the results and what changes need to be made to, make, to meet it? Thanks, Jessica. And, and I think that's a little bit of where the kind of long-term analysis and the communication might overlap with each other. I, um, I see your point there. Um, and, and perhaps as, as we kind of nail down some of those um, methods for the long-term analysis, some of, some of these communication strategies might be made a little bit more clear. Thank you, Natalie. Question from Anthony Beckham. Has there been any analysis done with GWSI well data to assess longer water level trends throughout the AMA like Xi'an is suggesting? Sorry, throughout the AMA. I'm not I think sure. is what he meant there. Don't think we have anyone from our hydrology group on the call today, but um, there is analysis done with that GWSI data where there, there is um, statewide water level change mapping done uh, on, on a rotating basis, but I'm not remembering the exact cycle of whether it's um, annual or not. Um, but, but on a regular basis, that, that data is analyzed to, to look at water level changes across the state and including inside um, the AMAs. So, so that is certainly um, 
data that our hydrology group looks at and incorporates into the model. And, and as I said earlier, I'm, I'm uh, because not uh, all of the water that is underground is groundwater or for the purposes of safe fields, some of it's CAP water, some of it's effluent, um, we have to kind of look at things, look at things a little bit differently. It's not perfectly tied to, to just those groundwater levels. It's also uh, a little bit more localized and, and nuanced based on the type of water that is actually stored underground. So um, there's, there's certainly a lot of complexity there, but I do believe some of that groundwater level kind of truthing, if you will, is incorporated through ADWR's models. Thank you, Natalie. Comment from Pam Muse. I think you, I think you have to do the best you can with the calculation, understanding that ADWR gets more data over time. The calcula calculation may evolve, but you need some measure, some number, or at least to get an idea of where you're at. But I agree with Jessica. It's how ADWR responds to the number that is great. When you're driving your car down the road, if you start to move to the left or to the right, you don't jerk the steering wheel. It's the response that matters. I appreciate the analogy. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Nothing further at this time, Natalie. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and move on. Uh, if there's additional comments, come in. Uh, we, can, we can get to those at the end. I, I very, very much appreciate all of your um, comments and suggestions and, and engagement. Um, throughout today's meeting and, and really throughout this whole process. We've, we've gotten a lot of engagement and feedback, um, particularly in this group, and we've, it's been really beneficial and, and has allowed us to create uh, ultimately a better work product, including that, including that dashboard um, to assist in these conversations and to assist all of you. So, so thank you very much for all of that. Um, we... So we'll go ahead and kind of start wrapping up. Um, McKenna, if you would share that questionnaire link in the chat again, I'd really appreciate that. Um, so we are, again, looking for um, lots of feedback. <laughs> we, we, you all have provided uh, just an enormous amount of feedback uh, throughout the course of today's meeting and our previous meetings. Um, and, and we're just trying to make, um, some of that feedback a little bit easier on you, asking some specific questions in the questionnaire and allowing a little bit of space to um, elaborate on, on those types of things. It can be a little bit hard to gauge consensus when we're, when we're not all in a room and I can't see people's heads nodding all around. So we're hoping that the um, questionnaire can, can help assist with kind of uh, gauging the feeling of the group on, on consensus and some other items like that. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, we are kind of moving into these uh, later phases of, of our strategy for this group. Um, I, I think we've got some really promising feedback um, and, and ideas for this long-term analysis. We'll certainly come back to that in our next meeting and, and maybe kind of start to wrap up those long-term analysis conversations. Um, and we'll continue this conversation on how we might best communicate safe field and, and customize our strategies for different audiences and, and all of that. So um, your feedback throughout the process has been really helpful. We do appreciate all of that. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so do have additional upcoming meetings um, of the work group. Uh, and I think our next meeting is an agricultural subgroup on July 20th, uh, municipal the following week on the 28th, um, and then a turf meeting on August 4th uh, with a full worker meeting uh, to kind of update everyone on the, the progress of all of those groups on um, August 18th. So we have a lot going on. Um, we do appreciate your participation throughout this process. Um, all of our, excuse me, um, meeting information 
is available on ADWR's public meeting calendar. There is also a dedicated uh, management plans work group or fifth management plans space on ADWR's website where all of our meetings are posted with the uh, recordings of each meeting and the presentations from each meeting. So all of that uh, past meeting information is also available on our website. Um, obviously, I will would encourage all of you to also check out the AMA data page. There is just a huge amount of information available on ADWR's website. We have been doing a lot of work over the last few years to improve the transparency of our data and and this safe field dashboard uh, development is really just another step in in that process so we're really excited. we hope that you'll um check it out and and let us know if there's any ways that we can make it better if you have any questions so with that um i can uh, take any questions if there were any additional questions. Um, no questions with regards to Safe Field at this time. Uh, Lacey James looks like she's having some difficulties with our survey link, mm -hmm. but no questions or comments um, for you right now, Natalie. Okay. Great. We'll, we'll, I, the link seems to be working for me, but we will um, double check on that and make sure it's publicly available. Um, maybe. Getting some feedback that it's working for some others, it looks like. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Lacey, if you have any trouble uh, getting into it, um, uh, we can provide you the questions that were in the survey and, and you could just email us if that would be easier. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, well, with that, uh, seeing no more questions, um, thank you everybody for your time. I know, I know I keep saying it, but we are so immensely grateful for uh, the strong participation we've had throughout this process and, and the extensive feedback we have re received, um, particularly on, on this topic. So, so we very much appreciate all of you and all of the time that you've all invested in this. So um, with that, we can close. Um, thank you all for being here today and I hope you all stay safe. Thank you.